Let's say we have a mirror and an incoming vector shown in blue and a reflected vector shown in green. As you can imagine, as you tilt the mirror, the green vector will change. And this is true whether you rotate the mirror in two dimensions or in three dimensions like I'm doing now. In this video, we're going to derive the formula used to calculate this reflection. So, let's get started. Okay, so we have an incoming vector and an outgoing vector. Let's also draw the normal vector to our mirror here in orange. I'll call the incoming vector v1, the reflected vector v2, and our unit normal vector to our mirror n. Now our aim in this video is to express v2 as some matrix times v1. And so we need to find this mirror matrix M that makes this happen. And before we get too deep into the mathematics, I'm going to define the magnitude of V1 to be equal to 1, and the magnitude of V2 to be equal to 1 as well. And the reason I'm doing this is because right now I only care about the direction of the vectors. I don't care about how big they are. Although we'll talk more about this at the end. Okay, now for the math. From the law of reflection, we know that this angle here must be equal to this angle here. Now let me do something clever. Because we're dealing with vectors, I'm going to redraw v1 here facing the other way, like this. Now because it's facing the other way, this vector is technically minus v1. And notice that the sum of these two vectors must be parallel with the normal vector n. Now let's find the height in the direction of n. Well, the angle here must be theta, so we now can calculate the height. The height of this part is 1 cosine theta, and the height of this part is 1 cosine theta as well. All this means is that the sum of these two vectors, v2 minus v1, is equal to their combined height, 1 cosine theta plus 1 cosine theta, times their direction vector, which is n. Simplifying this, we get 2 cosine theta n. Bringing v1 to the other side yields this. And there we go. We've got an expression to work with that I'll call equation 1. Now we just need to simplify it by finding an expression for cosine theta. Cosine theta can be found by drawing the vectors n and minus v1 again, side by side. The angle between these two vectors must be theta. Now we can use the angle between vectors formula to find cosine theta directly. We know that cosine theta must equal minus v1 dot n divided by the magnitude of minus v1 times the magnitude of n. Well, the magnitudes of both of these vectors are 1 by definition, so that means that cosine theta is equal to minus v1 dot n. And let's call that equation 2. Okay, so we've got two equations, 1 and 2. Let's solve them by substituting equation 2 into equation 1. This yields v2 is equal to v1 plus 2 times minus v1 dot n times n. To simplify this, we're going to recall some properties for real dot products. If I have a vector x dot another vector y, then this is equal to x transpose y, which is equal to y transpose x. Now, I like to remember this by visualizing matrix multiplication. Since one vector is always on the side, they multiply all pairs of elements together just like normal dot products would. Okay, so let's simplify this by sucking out the minus sign and writing v1 dot n as n transpose v1. And let's remind ourselves that this term in here, this dot product, is just a scalar. It's just a regular old number. And because it's just a scalar, we can bring that n at the end here and push it to the front like this. 
Next, I'm going to write our vector V1 as the identity matrix I times V1. Notice it doesn't change anything because the identity times a vector is that vector itself. Okay, now for the final step. I'm going to factor out a V1 from both expressions so that we get V2 is equal to I minus 2N N transpose times V. And believe it or not, we've actually solved our problem. We have found a way to calculate our reflection from a simple matrix multiplication, where the messy stuff written between these brackets is our mirror matrix M. We found it. Okay, but let's see what this mirror matrix actually looks like. Well, in 2D, the normal vector to our mirror will only have two components, which I'll call N1 and N2. The identity will hence also be a 2 by 2, and N and N transpose will look like this. Now we'll just do the matrix multiplication. Notice that N times N transpose will actually end up forming just another 2 by 2 matrix. We can sum these two matrices together to get the following mirror matrix, and we're done. Notice that the mirror matrix depends entirely on the normal vector, nothing else. This actually makes sense, because the normal vector will capture everything we need to know about the tilt of the mirror. In fact, you can think of the normal matrix as a property of the mirror rotation. And so this might make you think, could you also describe the mirror matrix without using the vector n, but instead using the angle from the horizontal alpha? Well, yes you can. They convey the exact same information. You just need to plug in n1 is equal to minus sine alpha, and n2 is equal to cosine alpha. And so making the substitution results in another equally good mirror matrix that uses the angle of the mirror alpha instead. You can choose whichever one you prefer. Okay, but what about three dimensions? Well, in this case, the normal vector will have three components, n1, n2, and n3. Going through the same multiplication as last time will result in this beast of a matrix that I'm showing here. And there we go. We are done. We found a way to calculate the reflection vector by simply multiplying the input by the mirror matrix itself. Now, before I end this video, I thought I'd mention one small little detail. Sometimes this question is posed slightly differently. Instead of considering something bouncing off a mirror, sometimes it's viewed as a rotation around a mirror, or about finding an image point through the mirror. But rest assured, this really is the same problem. The mirror matrix is the exact same. And the vectors don't have to be unit vectors either. They can be any length. Because if you multiply a constant by V1, then V2 will grow by the same amount. Anyway, I hope that derivation made sense. Cheers, guys.